Well, so Paul was a perfect straight man for a lot of things I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk about a little play on words here, but sustaining an advanced manufacturing workforce, and both from what we need to do to, to increase the pipeline of students in STEM, as well as using uh, sustainability as a topic to keep their attention. So this is, uh, are the industries that Siemens is in, and one of the things I talk about is we're seeing increasing product and process complexity across every one of these product lines that we build in our own companies, as well as uh, the customers that we have for the software that we supply to over 77,000 companies in the world today. So it's very hard to pick up a product today or to, uh, to walk into a building or travel throughout our daily life without running into something that's a combination of uh, mechanical, electrical, electronic, software. You know, maybe the chair you're sitting in doesn't have software in, but almost everything else that we have today does. And so as we see that product and process complexity increasing, it changes the way that we have to eventually respond and train and, and how we prepare our workforce uh, and the future students that are going to go into that workforce. This is a slide about Industry 4.0. And uh, you can see, starting over there on the left, that when we had the, the first industrial revolution, you know, it was really about based on the introduction of kind of mechanical production equipment, often driven by water or, or steam energy. And, uh, you know, that started back in the late 1700s, went through the 1800s. A uh, little footnote on the bottom there, Siemens was founded in um, October of 1847. So we've lived this uh, on the, the business side of our business for, for the, the whole time. When you get into the second industrial revolution, you really got into mass production that was achieved by division of labor. You started to see electricity introduced into the process, but still a fairly low complexity of what you had to know to, uh, to support those kinds of systems. And you get into the third industrial revolution uh, in the, the past, later part of the last century, and you get into based on the use of electronics, IT, you know, we started to introduce robots and the complexity went up another level. And then when you get where we are today, you're really mixing in that mix of, uh, you know, of, of cyber physical systems, right? So we, we talk about virtual to real product development and everything starts with a concept. The requirements start with a concept that's captured. And it really changes, um, you know, what we, how far we can go before we actually build something, right? And uh, it's, it's a really intriguing process. So if you, you look back just in, in many of our lifetimes, at how people used to design and collaborate. This is a pretty typical scene, right? This is the 50s or the 60s. But today, everything's about 3D models, and the way we collaborate and the way we are located to do that collaboration is different. Uh, top left hand, you've got the, the NASA JPL uh, Curiosity rover, which was, was designed and built with, with our software. Um, you've got uh, GM car on the right. It's designed all over the world. The people who you're working with may or may not even be in this, the same building, let alone the same continent. So it's not just the products have changed the way that they're designed. We, we design and build uh, all the systems to assemble them and manufacture them as well, right? Um, robots, work cells, people, simulating the, the effort for it. And so, you know, the goal of this is to change people's minds. So this was actually a Chrysler plant back in the 50s, the main Chrysler plant, so, or the 60s even. So, you know, I um, was, heard a presentation not long ago at the American Association of Community Colleges, and they referred to this as the three Ds that people associated with manufacturing, uh, dark, dangerous, and dirty, right? And that's still what a lot of people think about of manufacturing in the, the U.S. or around the world, particularly today, that they think that the the jobs that are coming back that are here today are in the dark, dirty, and dangerous factories, but they're not. And, and you know, this isn't just a U.S. phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. So anybody recognize this building? This is actually a pretty cool factory. This is the Volkswagen factory in Dresden, Germany. They sometimes call the the transparent factory. And, uh, you know, this could be right out of uh, the Google complex in, in, uh, in the Val Silicon Valley or or any place else, but this is the what we have to start to help parents and students understand that manufacturing is about today. If you ever see the inside of this factory, yes, this is a, a factory with hardwood floors. Um, I'm not kidding. And the, the robotics have changed. The way people work with the, the systems have changed. They're all designed the the, with the virtual and the physical first, uh, with virtual commissioning. 
this round part of the building is where they, they um, you know, store the cars that are built before they're shipped out. This is in the center of the city, by the way. This isn't out in the burbs. And the way they deliver material to the factory is on the same light rail system that people travel on, except they've got uh, specialized, um, really neat looking trains that, that bring that on the same tracks as the people. So people just integrated this into, into their city. So this is the kind of perception we need to bring to the, the students today and to the people who are going to be our employees tomorrow of what manufacturing is today. And we better do that soon because there's a lot of unfilled manufacturing jobs out there. This is a report that I cite a lot from the World Economic Forum. There's lots of sources of data like this that talks about 10 million unfilled manufacturing jobs around the world today. And you can see from this chart that the biggest needs are you know in India and China and then the US is third on that now that's not because all the jobs have gone to India and China that's those are fast-growing economies as well so they have to to compete just to fill their domestic needs for it um, the interesting thing about this chart is is that if you look at the the size of the needs it's it's also plotted against the uh, relative unemployment rates in the countries as well so one of the things you find is the greatest needs for these uh, technically trained people are actually in countries where it have some of the highest unemployment rates. So that helps you understand that it's not really a shortage of people, even though we're all facing this uh, increased retirement, right? The, the baby boomers beginning a couple years ago started about 10,000 people a day that reached the age of 65. It's going to go on for another 16 years or so. So we have to, we have to produce enough people to replace those people are going to be retiring, but it's also based on the growth. And so it's not a shortage of people yet. It's a shortage of people with the right skills and the right training. So when we start to look at where uh, those employees of tomorrow with the, the STEM trained people are coming from, this chart on the left, uh, this is from a report from the Center for American Progress shows the share of the world's college graduates. And the, the, the three bars on the left are the, are the US share. And you can see that the, that the share of the, that the US produces in the world in STEM graduates is, is decreasing. We're actually in real numbers still producing more, but we're only growing at about 24% annually from 2000 to 2008 in terms of the, the increase in STEM graduates. But uh, China and India, who had those other big needs um, on the chart are, are doing more to fulfill their needs. China STEM graduates increased about 218% annually. Uh, and India was growing at almost 300% annually. So, you know, the market economy is, is working itself out to, to uh, create STEM graduates where they're needed, but we're still not producing enough. We have to get more in the pipeline, especially in the U.S. if we want to see that competitiveness continue. This is an interesting slide, uh, pretty recent, from uh, a study according to the Brookings Institute that talks about the hidden STEM economy. Um, the, this report kind of suggests that there are actually more STEM jobs out there that any of us who have talked about it a lot are actually talking about. And they're saying that because of that change in, in technology complexity, if you remember that slide I showed about um, Industry 4.0, you know, with each of the revolutions you saw the base complexity of everything increasing that there are actually about 26 million jobs, not, not uh, these are not uh, openings, but 26 million jobs in the U.S. economy that actually require uh, STEM skills. And so uh, there's a whole wealth of jobs that are not counted that are essentially blue collar jobs but require you to have, have STEM, uh, a STEM base. And they estimate that 50% of those jobs don't require a four year degree. So we've been putting a lot of emphasis on apprentice programs, on community colleges as well, because there are, you know, to those 10 million jobs, unfilled jobs, are not all engineering jobs, right? They're the people that support engineers, they're the skilled technologists, the design technologists, and the, the skilled uh, tool operators. And there's a lot of need for that that community colleges or apprentice programs can fulfill. And they're good jobs, right? Half of all the STEM jobs are available to workers without a four-year college degree, and they average about $53,000 according to this study. So that's a whole, we talk about remanufacturing the middle class through a software IT revolution. It's all about helping people to find those good paying jobs. And those jobs are really all across the US. This is uh, from that same report. 
and this talks about the, the size or the, the percent of STEM jobs in the top 100 metro areas in the country. And of course, you can see in the big metro areas, you've got clusters of uh, a lot of STEM jobs. You're gonna find a lot of STEM jobs there that require four-year degrees as well. But when you get out into the, the, the other cities, you can see that this STEM job base is really all across the US, any place that you find any manufacturing. So um, this slide is a new piece of data that I just found in the last week or so, and um, I call it, it's kind of a good news, bad news slide. So the ACT is one of the standardized tests, as you all know, that most high school graduates take to, uh, who are thinking about going on to um, a college degree. And this is the data in a, a report called the, the National STEM Report that ACT put out for 2013. So this talks about the graduating class in 2013. And of 54% uh, of the graduating class took the ACT. So it's a pretty big sample set side, right? We're well beyond kind of the, the error margin here. And so of the almost 1.8 million graduates um, that, that, or 54 percent of the class of 2013 that took the ACTs, 48.3 percent expressed an interest in STEM careers, some form of STEM. Now ACT defines STEM to include not, not only science and computer science and math or engineering technology, but medical and health as well. Now, there's a lot of interesting data in this study. Uh, the majority of that 48.3% were actually women, which I think is, is fantastic for some of the things we've been trying to drive more interest in, uh, in STEM for uh, females. But now the bad news part. If you look at the um, numbers according to the ACT that had an expressed interest and tested, like they could meet that interest that were prepared, it was only about a third of those folks who expressed an interest actually were measured as, uh, as being able to, to kind of succeed in that interest. So it's a good news, bad news. We've got more people interested in STEM-based careers, and I think everybody uh, can agree that the dialogue in the last five years, it's, you know, I, five years ago we had to explain to a lot of people what STEM was. Now it's, it's pretty much in the national, uh, the national, national lexicon. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Now, this is definitely um, an opportunity slide or, or a bad news slide. This is from that, that same study we talked about previously for the Center for American Progress, but this, this statistic's pretty startling. One million freshmen uh, that um, each year from two-year and four-year colleges don't return as sophomores, and only 48% of the students who enroll in four-year degree programs in, in STEM um, end up completing their degree in, uh, or fail to, to complete their degree in six years. So I, it's not surprising when you look back to that data that we just talked about with the ACT that there's a lot of people interested, but they're not well prepared to get there, right? So they don't succeed and, the, and they move on to other things. So we've got our job cut out for us as an industry to, to make that better. And so there are some really neat things, um, you know, that we're doing to try and change things up. I believe we have to teach things differently. And, you know, we're doing a lot of hands-on projects and programs to be successful with that. This is a program called Green Power, based out of the UK. The first one's in the US, where kids are building electric cars. Everybody gets the sustainable aspect of it now, right? The kids get it, they understand it. They want to do things that uh, make the environment better. So you can see the smiling, happy faces. They have divisions that go from elementary school up through high school, even up into a professional level. Building and racing the, the, the cars uh, on the Goodwood track in, in, uh, in the UK. This is actually a, an event I was at last week. This is the Boeing fly-off for the aerospace program where you might think, okay, what's that have to do with sustainability? Well, guess what? Every one of those UAVs, the mission they gave them to build from scratch and fly these things was designed uh, to go out and do crop surveys and find out where you could, uh, you know, apply less fertilizer, things more precision, see how crops are doing. And so even though it's an aerospace problem, you had aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers working on it, the, the, the problems that we gave them was around uh, a sustainable problem. And they get to do really neat things. They built really creative things. That, that guy on the left is an astronaut that they got to work with that's one of the, the judges with us on this program. And then uh, working with the PACE program, sustainable urban transport designs, students that get to travel all over the world or participate in these projects, EcoCar 
project, which is all about taking an existing car, ripping out the drivetrain, replacing it with energy efficient technology. Um, again, look at these pictures, right? Smiling, happy faces, men, women, you know, hands on education, all on a problem set that, uh, that is around sustainability. Now, this is actually pretty fun. This was at the Yuma Proving Grounds in Arizona where the teams came to compete. And there's actually a couple students there. This is mainly the NC State team. But as you can see, they cut loose and have a little bit of fun there. But here's the thing. You talk about dedication. Some of these students were missing their graduations to be at the Proving Grounds for the final competition. You know, it's hard to manage this, the schedules of 15 schools in the, the spring competition. But they, they were happy to do it, right? And they missed your graduation from college to come work in a garage in Arizona. It was pretty fun. And, you know, every once in a while, somebody neat would stop by the garage. This is the Ohio State team when, when President Obama visited. But I kind of say no matter who's hanging around their garage, this is the, neat, the better part. What, what I think we need to do to build into all these programs, and EcoCar is a great example of it, is they're not only judged on the designs they come up with, they're judged on the outreach, on the STEM outreach to the next generation and the schools behind them. So you've got these college kids going into middle schools and elementary schools. And so these kids are seeing people that are closer to their own age rather than people that look like me, right, that are coming and talking to them about careers in engineering. And so, you know, if you look at these classrooms and hands, you think these kids are going to be more interested in manufacturing or advanced manufacturing and technology when the time comes to do it? I think they will. So uh, manufacturing has changed. So must the way we educate. Students, I think there's great problem sets we can give them to work on around sustainability. And the big thing is we've got to change the hearts and minds, not only of the students, but of the parents as well. Thank you.